Today's guest is Chris Parnham, who is the co-author of DeLorean Celebrating the Impossible and DeLorean Historian of Note. Chris is currently the historian of the DeLorean Owners Club here in the UK. According to my research, Chris has owned 17 DeLoreans and has managed to buy his original back. Chris, I've just scratched the surface a little in my introduction, so who is Chris Parnham? Well, uh, yes, um, uh, Chris Barnum is retired, but uh, Chris Barnum's had a, a long and active life, started in the motor, motor trade as an apprentice carriage mechanic, um, eventually moved into the motorcycle trade, and then um, into industry at British Selenese, um, chemist and what have you. And then from there, I started my own company, which was Derby Plating Services, which I ran successfully for over 30 years. And uh, it was during that time that I um, reinstated my um, interest in classic cars, because actually um, um, I've been interested in classic cars since I first started in the garage trade. But um, when it morphed into being my day job, it does tend to take the shine off it. And when you're doing other people's bumpers and hubcaps and uh, and bits of trim and stuff uh, uh, day in day out for 30 odd years you tend to uh, go off them a bit so um when i eventually got back into cars um i thought well i'll i'll try and find a car that um is um uh devoid of chrome plating and something that you don't have to be welding welding and bodging and you know sorting out paintwork because that was the pain of my um uh life before so that's, um, and now I'm retired, so um, I, I spend all my time mucking about in the garage and mucking about with me, DeLoreans, and all the cars. Uh, it sounds, sounds similar to me. I, I kind of was doing it as a job, and then it got a bit of a chore and, and everything else, and I ended up sort of doing other things as a hobby, and you move away from it, don't you? That's the, that's right, that's the yeah. thing, I think. But um, Why DeLoreans, I guess? But I think you kind of just answered that a little bit about not having chrome on it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, that, that was the um, that was a certainly big attraction initially. But um, the other, the main reason actually was I used to go to the NEC Classic Car Show every year with our Derby plating stand. Uh, the firm's still going, incidentally, but I have no involvement with it now. Um, but um, while I was there, I used to wander around the other stands as you do, and uh, the DeLorean stand uh, always got a wonderful stand, and yet it was only a tiny club. And this was because one of the joint um, um, uh, founders of the club was a chap called, is a chap called Dave Howard, who is now our president. But his day job was building stands for people. So, of course, uh, we used to punch above our weight with our stands. <laughs> and oh, um, yeah. but they were very welcoming people. Um, I don't know if you, was, many of your listeners, I'm sure, will have been to the uh, classic car show in Birmingham in the autumn usually November, and uh, wandered around the different stands. And some of them, I can't mention names, but are a trifle standoffish, um, if you'll forgive the pun. They certainly don't encourage people wandering around. You know, they have chains across the entrance and look from the barrier and yep. all this stuff. Well, the DeLorean Owners Club's never been like that. It's always been a very friendly and welcoming club. In fact, it welcomed me uh, um, a couple of years running, and that's what really sparked my interest. Dave Howarth and the rest of the people on the stand, um, you know, were very uh, helpful and let me sit in them. And I, the more I sat in them and thought about them, I thought, I like these, you know. They're, they're very distinctive. There's no welding, no rot, and no chrome. And it's got things like air conditioning and central locking, so it ticks an awful lot of boxes for me. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's, it's a great reason to get involved as well. I mean, I, I'm a member of a few clubs. I'm, I've got a model, not 29 Model A, and I'm a member of the Model A club, and I've got a Herald for my wife. So, you know, you, right. you, you need to have the club, sort of infrastructure around it to make it enjoyable don't you i think i think that's part of the yes and of course the delorean owners club was actually founded in 1996 when the interweb wasn't really going and um uh, up until then any delorean owners in england and there was a few because uh, um uh, we'll probably come on to this later but mm. uh, during receivership and after receivership a lot of cars are actually sold off in the uk yes these yep. were cars that should have been scrapped these were pre-production cars and early pilot cars and all sorts of cars uh, but when people actually um, went to misham auction or sort of, well um uh, british car auctions in general they were flogging them off all over the uk 
Um, when people end up buying one, uh, they couldn't actually put them on the road in those days because the government put all sorts of obstacles in front of them. And uh, it was several years before anybody could actually register one for road use. But uh, uh, without the Internet, uh, people were literally on their own, and that's why the club was founded, to yeah. give people access to, um, you know, to spares and knowledge and all the rest of it. And, of course, as the Internet's got more important, you know, the, we have a club website, uh, DeLoreanOwnersClub.co.uk, and there's another one as well, another DeLorean club that's uh, started for people that don't like to pay the subs. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. we, we publish a very nice colour magazine, uh, which um, we find is very attractive. We do that four times a year. Again, punching well above our weight, um, when you consider that uh, the club has normally got around 300 full-time paid-up members, um, but uh, which is good. tiny for a, a specialist car club, but mm -hmm. we, we, we really do produce some nice stuff, which, you, of course, it, it's actually nice to hold a magazine and flick through it and look at yeah. last years mm -hmm. and look at them 10 years ago. No, I agree, because so, I, uh, I still... Yeah, so the, club, the, the DeLorean was sort of self-selecting, really. Yeah, I... Um... I agree on the magazine and the tactile side of it because I subscribe to Hemmings Classic Car and I look because my main thing is kind of American cars, but it's I like to have a magazine and something to read. It's um, it's certainly you can look at things online and everything else, but it's not the same as having the magazine to read. So it's, it's no, exactly. Definitely, you're definitely right. What do you um, what classics do you currently own? If that's not a silly question, <laughs> uh, well, I've got um, uh, I've got a Peugeot two hundred five CTI. Uh, that's a ragtop GTI, mm. um, but it, even that's a bit special. I sort of inherited that. Well, actually, bought it off my son, who <laughs> bought it a few, what, a decade ago, more than a decade ago, and realised he got something a bit special. It was um, it was an automatic with air conditioning in one of a tiny batch of ten that were intended for the Japanese market, but oh. it got cancelled. So um, anyway, that's in my garage, and funnily enough, it's actually on sale at the moment on eBay. Yeah. Um, because um, I've had it for a decade in my garage, looking after it, but I've only ever driven it uh, for an MOT, and um, it's not really my thing. You know, I like it, but um, um, I, I'm not an enthusiast of them. Yeah. And then my daily driver is something a bit weird, um, which is a Rover 75 diesel. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. But it, I, I tell you what, I've had a few Rover 75s, a couple in the past, both petrols are 1.8 and a 2.5. But the thing is that um, most people know Rover 75s will know that BMW was in charge when these things were being made. And the petrol engines have a few issues, uh, the 1.8s uh, overheat if you're not careful. The 2 litres and 2.5 V6s tend to run out of cam belts if you're not careful and they're both not particularly economical but the bmw diesel engine one with the m47 diesel engine is a fantastic beast yeah. it's uh, extremely economical uh, very rugged and reliable it's got a chain uh, instead of a cam belt and uh, i think they're brilliant they're absolutely fantastic value for money it only stands for it a thousand quid it's got leather dual zone climate mm. automatic wipers cruise control you know, alloy wheels, got everything, uh, and it's just my daily hack. There's a gent around the corner here for me. Actually, he's got two of them, um, and he's he's had them. Seems like he's had them for years, and they always seem in lovely condition and not showing too much sign of um, any rust or anything like that. So, no, they, that's it. No, well, my my ambition is to find a fairly a really low mileage one. This one <coughs> uh, is from 164,000 miles, but you wouldn't know it driving it. Uh, in fact, I've been out for a long trip in it today, and it, it, it goes like a train, and does over 40 to the gallon. I mean, you, you no. can't complain at nope, that, can you? you certainly can't. What's your, uh, what's your favourite classic? Again, maybe a silly question. <laughs> well, actually, thinking about it, I think it still is the DeLorean. I mean, I've, I, I worked it out the other day. I'd had well over 100 uh, cars, and I'm not a car dealer, never been a car no, dealer, no, inclu no. including my 17 DeLoreans. Everything from... Well, my very first car was a Bond mini car, three-wheeler uh -huh. thing with a Villiers end. You used to have to kick under the bonnet. That was a horrible thing. Uh, then uh, my very first motorised thing of any sort was a Cycle Master, which was a, a, a winged wheel. You used to put in a push bike frame. Um, and then everything from V12 Jags and Land Rovers and Range Rovers and uh, 
mostly British stuff. I've never had a BMW or a Mercedes, but apart from that, I've I've more or less <laughs> been around the block. Well, not not the posh cars. I've not had any Ferraris no. or, uh, the, or the, um, Martins. The fact you mentioned the Bond is interesting because I interviewed Paula Cooper from the Bubble Car Museum. Uh, a oh, while yeah. back, and she's got all sorts of micro, well, what they call the uh, American listeners call micro cars now, but yes. um, she's got just about everything now. And there was some cars there that I'd never heard of in my entire life. <laughs> it, was, it was very strange, and it was. Um, and but, of course, they, they don't they don't take up much space, do they? No, so, she's got a huge you know, collection of them. I mean, motorbikes even better, of course. Motorbikes yeah. take up very little space. Definitely. But the mini cars and um, all those micro cars yeah. uh, don't tend up a lot of space. We. I mean, uh, um, a Rover 75 diesel estate takes up quite a bit of space, and a DeLorean takes up a fair bit. Yeah. So um, oh, there you go. I've got I've got five cars. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, I'm just trying to think what I've got. We've got our, mate, our daily driver is actually a Kia Sportage, yeah. a diesel automatic, which is a brilliant thing. Um, I had, that's only the second car I've ever had from new. Mm. Uh, it runs rings around me, a Volkswagen Touareg I had before that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a good. fantastic bit of kit, you know, and it's seven year warranty. It's halfway through that now, and uh, um, you know, it, it's it, it just does the job, and it goes like stink. In fact, it's got a, a button that you um, economy button. Now, if I don't have that pushed in, I find that every single time I pull away, and it's four permanent four wheel drive. Every time I pull away from junctions and traffic lights, I used to squeal the wheels. <laughs> so yeah. in eco mode, where it changes up a bit later, yeah. um, we don't get that problem. But uh, it, no, it's uh, but right, it, then it's again, that does thirty three to the gallon. That's, that's what you want. The Rover does um, certainly over forty. What about you? Um, have you ever had a, uh, an attack of buyer's remorse where you've bought something and thought, "Oh dear." <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I suppose I've had that a few times. I had that when I first bought this this second Rover. Well, it's not the second second diesel Rover seventy five, uh, because I, I ended up putting all four new springs on it and all sorts of stuff. But but you know that's just a challenge. But my real my remorse really is one I didn't buy. I was um, uh, I'm constantly cruising through eBay and looking at the. Uh, um, uh, uh, classic cars, non-specified or whatever they call it, the miscellaneous ones, and this this one popped up, and it was it looked like a frog-eyed sprite, but it was one of these cars that made a very tiny batch of them in I think it was the Isle of Wight, and they'd got a BMC, uh, well no uh, later than that, uh, um, uh, a Rover uh, uh, petrol engine in them, and uh, proper mechanics, and it was a proper one-off car. They only made um, a handful. I see one regularly when they've gone our classic night meets. But this thing, it looks like a frog eye. It drives like a modern car. Um, and they're cheap. Uh, when I saw this one, I took my DeLorean um, up to a, a place called Dale Abbey, um, not far from us in the Midlands. And I saw this uh, little yellow car. And I'd been watching one on eBay. And uh, the one on eBay, it, it was um, this car. It wasn't a kit car. It was a small production car. And it said that it had been laid up for 10 years and recently recommissioned and needed a few bits and bobs of work. But the photos, it looked brilliant. And it was, it sold for um, 1,600 quid. Wow. 1,600 pounds. Mm-hmm. Now, this chap with this lovely little yellow version of it, which I know he's put a lot of work into, but, I mean, that must be worth three, five thousand pounds without even trying. And, of course, if it was a genuine frog eye, it would be ten or fifteen thousand pounds. Oh, definitely. Pounds. I mean... Yeah. And it would be rotten. Uh, well, it would have been rotten at one stage in its life. Uh, and... Um, there's a friend of mine got one who's rather tall, and as he sits in the passenger seat, his, his chin is above the windscreen. But the um, the reproduction one, you sit a bit lower, and it was. It, I just wish I'd bought it, and I, I hesitated, and I've never seen another one come up sale. There you go. I'm sure you'll find one eventually. <laughs> well, yeah, but I need to get rid of the Peugeot to make room in the garage. Ah, I don't go. like my cars. I don't like my cars standing outside. Yeah, I've got because I've got my um, I've got my Model A in the garage here. I've got my I've got a Chevy truck that I bought a proper cover for that goes outside, and my Herald's down my dad's. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> that's the trouble. What about um, seller's remorse? One you've sold, and I I, I guess it might well, be your DeLorean, yeah, there maybe. Is, but there was two. I mean, one of them is the DeLorean that um, I bought back again. My current one of my current DeLoreans, which is my very first one I bought in 1999. Um, it was one of only three 
factory right hand drives. It was going to be the British version of the DeLorean. Um, but unfortunately, John DeLorean was set up by the FBI mm. and uh, fell into their trap. And that, that closed, that, that essentially, uh, the business was already due for, um, uh, for resurrection. Uh, the team of uh, previous managers were going to, uh, you know, rev it up again. But when he was, when John DeLorean was arrested with his suitcase full of cocaine in the hotel room in America, despite the fact that he was found not guilty a couple of yeah. years later, that was the end of the project. Yeah. Uh, but um, uh, uh, that car, one of those three cars, w would have been um, displayed at the NEC car show, not classic car show, yeah. in 1982. Um, but he was arrested uh, the day after, uh, and it never went there. So it's a very rare car. It's a right-hand drive automatic, yeah. grey interior, which I like. And I ran it for several years, and then I bought another. They're a bit like buses, you know. You, you go around looking <laughs> yeah. for a decent car, mm -hmm. you, you find one, and then all of a sudden you see them everywhere, don't you? Yeah, you do. Well, this, you do. this chap phoned me up and he said, I've got some DeLorean for sale. I said, I've got one, thank you. He said, uh, well, it's a right-hand drive. I said, so is mine. And he says, it's very low mileage. And I said, yeah, well, so is mine. And he said, um, it's in an auction. It didn't reach its reserve. And I said, well, what was its reserve? And he told me, and I knew that, uh, I, I mean, I was quite into right-hand drives by then. I've actually had um, six of them up to now. And uh, when he mentioned his reserve, and I said, it didn't sell. And he said, no, he says, well, it's not running. Um, he sent it from, actually from the Isle of Man, and it shipped to the UK, and they'd not really looked after it and sold it at auction as a non-runner. Well, it didn't sell. So anyway... I, I made him a bid, which was his reserve price. He said, well, if, if you want it that, you can have it. So my wife and I drove all the way down to Southampton, which is about uh, 250 miles from where we live in the mm. Midlands, and um, I bought it the next day, and we arranged to have it delivered. So I got this other one that I was driving, this new one. And when this chap came along to me and he said, that I want a, a right-hand drive DeLorean, I said, there aren't many. He says, it's got to be a grey interior. I said, that's even fewer. There's only four. And he says, it's got to be an automatic. I said, well, let's pin it down again. He says, there's only two. I said, I've got one of them, and it's not for sale. Anyway, he made me a daft offer, which I thought was a daft offer. So I thought, well, I've got the other one. So I sold it to him. But almost as soon as the transporter had taken it away, I regretted it. Mm. So when he phoned me up seven years later... Well, I got this phone call, and I thought, I recognize that voice. He came, um, it wasn't the owner, it was the man who looked after his collection for him. Ah. The owner was a, a, a solicitor based in the Philippines. Oh, okay. English bloke. Yeah. But anyway, this chap down at Devon, or Dorset, uh, he was looking after his collection. So when he phoned me, was that Mr. Barnum? I said, yes. Mm -hmm. I thought, I recognize your voice. He's, uh, he says, about a DeLorean. I says, what, the right-hand drive? And he says, yes. Anyway, to cut a long story short, um, this chap had had an unfortunate uh, marital situation and a divorce, and his wife was getting uh, his collection of classic cars, uh, plus some of his English houses, and so it was obviously up for sale. Uh, but it was the week after I'd appeared in a TV program called... Um, um, uh, for the Love of Cars with yep. uh, Philip Blenster. Yeah, I love that series. Well, I was, yeah, yeah well, I was the right-hand drive expert that wheeled ah. on to look at another one they were doing up. And, um, of course, it was sold at an auction, and it made good money. Yeah. And so when this chap phoned up and he said, what's it worth? I said, did you see that program that was aired the other night? And he said, yes. I said, did, did the um, ladies, uh, did the ex-wife see it? Yes, she did. And well, that, that's dropped my legs from underneath me. But anyway, um, I know this car has got a few faults, and it's still had it, done nothing to it, apart from driven it 700 miles in the seven years it was away from me. So anyway, I, I bought it back at his silly price, plus 10%. They were happy, I was happy, and I got my car back. So um, that was the one that got away, but I managed to get it back again. <laughs> Have you still got that one now? Oh, yes, that's oh. my... In fact... 
it, it's it's very poorly as of today. Ah. I took it. <laughs> I was taking it for an MOT yesterday, and there was these horrible crunching, groaning noises coming from underneath it. Mm. And um, having investigated it, I found that the diff had got hardly any oil in there, and uh, it's. Um, and uh, basically, it's disintegrated, so Oops. I've got to sort that out. That's going to be another gearbox, which is a bit of a pain. Yeah. But there you go. Is that a, is that a Renault box? Yes, it's yeah. a, yes, it is. Renault, is it UN1? Mm. But it's an automatic, that one, uh, which is... Um, uh, um, I believe they're quite common. The people put them in uh, all sorts of yeah. uh, weird yeah. and wonderful cars. Yeah. But it is an auto, you see, so it makes it a little bit uh, trickier. Yeah, more a little bit more expensive, I guess. You said you yeah. had a you said you had a second one that got away. What was what was that one? Um, oh yes, well I, I also bought another DeLorean, but it was a left hand drive one. I uh, I've not had many left hand drive ones. Most of mine have been right hand drive, and um, it was um, and that again was at an auction. Didn't sell. This is before they became really popular. And um, its reserve price was 10,000 quid, and it didn't make it. And it, was, it had done 110 miles Ooh. from new. And it was one of the very last ones made. It was a 1983. It was a grey interior, which is desirable, manual, which is very desirable. So it had ticked every single box, other than the fact it wasn't running. And the, the killer on it... Because of its, um, the chap that had registered it previously had not really done much of a job on it. They had not ascertained the year. And so it had been given, in the UK, they gave given Q plates. Q something, something, something. Now that is really, Q stands for sort of queer, not r- quite right. Yeah. And it's sort of the kiss of death to any uh, a kit car or something. They don't look good, Qs on them. Um, but I thought, well, I'll take a chance on this. It's got to be right at that right money. And once I got it back home, um, it took me a week of talking to the DVLA, the Licensing Authority, to get the number plate sorted out properly. They'd not heard of 83 ones. They only made a handful of them. Um, but anyway, we sorted out. We got a proper 83 number. Uh, and I got the thing running. It didn't take me more than an afternoon to get it running. And I started driving it, and it was it, one of the last ones made, and it was so, everything was so right about it. Tight, uh, nothing squeaked, rattled, everything worked. And I ran it for, on and off for a couple of years, and I made the mistake of turning it into a Back to the Future car. Ah. Mm. Because they were just coming out, and I had the very first running Back to the Future car in the UK. Now there's a dozen of them, literally. Um... Funny you but should I say do... that. I, I was in a traffic jam on the M4 about ooh, two months ago, and one overtook me on the back of a lorry. <laughs> yeah, well, I know that'll be that'll be Ollie Wilkins. Yeah. Wilkins, his tends to go around on the lorry. Yeah, but a I white used to truck. drive mine. Yeah. And oh, okay. um, um, I, I, when I put the Back to the Future gear on it, that the chap called Chris Nicholson, who is the world's leading stainless steel expert, happens to live on Canby Island in the UK. He goes all over the world fixing these DeLoreans. Well, he'd started making these DeLorean Back to the Future kits. And uh, I was the first one to have one. And I uh, got Chris to fit it for me. And we fit it in uh, with a method where you didn't, it never drilled a single hole in the car, never altered anything. We picked up from existing fixtures and had other pieces made. So, in other words, I ran it for a couple of years as a Back to the Future car. But it, it turned into a business. I mean, I'd already got my business. I got my Derby plating business, chrome plating. And I didn't want another business. Chrome uh, classic cars for me are a hobby. Yes. But when somebody says to you, right, I want you to stick it in this shopping centre for a couple of days and we'll pay you £2,000, I mean, it's very difficult to say no. <laughs> Correct, yes. <laughs> so, so after a bit of that, I took all the gear off it again and put it onto a, a cheap old banger, which still looked lovely. Um, and I got my... 1983 car back but by then it had done quite a few miles well let's say quite a few two or three thousand mm. but sometimes because it was a uh, a working job if you like some of them had been in the winter when i would never normally drive any of my classic cars in the snow and oh, things okay. like that yep. and so it was not pristine underneath anymore but it drove lovely still um and somebody came along and offered me uh, a decent price for it and i reluctantly sold it 
without all the gear, as I said, I'd already put us under the mm. car. But it, it was so right, because it was one of the last ones made, and because it was virtually, well, even when I sold it, I think it only done 3,000 miles, it was no more than that. So it was lovely and tight, everything worked. It was just a beautiful car, and uh, I wish I'd not sold it. Uh, mm. So that I really, I wish I'd not sold that one even more than the right-hander I'm driving at the moment, because that one was just... There was absolutely nothing wrong with it. it well, you know, you never know. You might get a chance to get it back one day. I well, guess. I might do, but I have actually communicated with the chap a couple of times in the past, and he shows no signs oh, of right. ever wanting to part with yeah. it. Oh, well. <laughs> I've not pursued it because. Um, I need to make some more garage space before I go looking for new cars. <laughs> I was just going to ask you, actually, what your roles within the club have been since the beginning, I guess. Yes, well, when I joined the club um, in about 1997, without checking, you've been going a couple of years, and the chap, the other joint founder of it, a chap, chap called Simon Lees Milne, he's, uh, he was into classic cars, and he, him and Dave Howard, who I'd already mentioned, who's now our club president, they were the two that, uh, that started the club. And when I joined a couple of years later, Simon was tearing his hair out trying to get material for the magazine. This is before the interwebs. And um, he was ready for throwing the towel in. And um, he said, um, he was, obviously, it's worn him down, you know. And, uh, and um, I, funnily enough, I was actually at um, um, a big, in fact, they just had one a fortnight ago, um, DeLorean five yearly event in Northern Ireland where they meet at the factory again and uh, I was at this one um, about about 2000 I can't remember the exact date and um, I heard these two Americans talking to each other and one of them said uh, there's a UK club you know and the other chap says yeah but he says it's it's only been going a couple of years I can't see it it'll fold soon and um, I thought that, that irritated me um, you know, I was a new member of this new club, and I knew that, that things weren't going so well. And so I, I uh, my hackles uh, raised, and I thought, well, it won't be, it won't let me a fold if it's left to me. So I said to Simon, I said, no, oh, Simon, I said, you're struggling a bit with this club, aren't you? He says, yes. I said, do you fancy, uh, can I take over as secretary for a bit? Yes, you can, bloody have it, he says. So uh, I had it. And Dave and I worked together, and we were, when I joined, I was member number 40. And by the time I relinquished my secretaryship about 10 years later, we'd got 400 members then. And it's sort of steadied off around 300 members ever since. That's and that's good. paid up members. That's good. What about, how did the book come about then? This is it, that's interesting. Well, again, this, um, it, it, that starts back to the early days of the internet. Um, I used to follow a thing called, well, I can't remember the exact name of it now, but it was an American forum. Um, I think it might have been DeLorean Talk or DMC Talk, but there's been several that's come and gone. Um, and there was this one email that I saw, and uh, somebody asked uh, a chap called Larry something, I'll never forget. Uh, some, he asked an innocent question. He said, that, did they ever build any right-hand drive DeLoreans? And somebody else answered, who was um, uh, high up in this interweb club, and said, no, they'd got plans to, but they never did. Now, at that moment in time, I was uh, secretary of the UK club, and I'd got four right-hand drive DeLoreans, all built by the factory. And so this irritated me somewhat. So I fired off um, an email back, said, yes, and they did actually make them. Uh, they made uh, over a dozen um, Plus, these, uh, some of them are subcontract, subcontracted out to a firm called Woolahodek. That was a dozen of them made there. And then there was these three or four that they made in the factory. So there was about 16 of them. Um, and I said, yes, they did actually make them. And I was talking to Andrew Withers. Uh, he was then the newsletter editor. And it wasn't a newsletter. It was a full glossy magazine. Uh, that was Andy's part-time job being... Um, um, a graphic artist as well as a computer expert and I said to him I said you know I said um, there's a lot of ignorance kicking around um, in the world because it was uh, internet it's the world uh, about what happened who did what what was built I said I think there's space to do a book here he said well I'm up for it if you are well that was 16 years ago 
so we started collecting bits and bobs for, for our book. It was only ever something that was on the sort of a, a, a thought we might do it. And then in 2002, we were visiting Northern Ireland again. I think it might have been one of these gatherings. And we actually discovered the entire factory archive of photos at a firm called Esla Crawford Photography in Belfast. And he still got all the negatives. And he'd never been paid. Anyway, we went to see him. And his offices were basically in a, an old terraced house uh, with old wooden shelving upstairs in the roof space and things. And it had got priceless boxes of negatives. And, uh, of course, it was all chemical photography in those days. Mm. And they were everywhere. Uh, the, the, the drawing archive sort of told um, about six shoe boxes, but it was enough. There was over 2,000 different images. And we eventually ended up doing a deal with them, which cost me a lot of money. In fact, I could have bought um, a fixer-up DeLorean for the price I paid for the <laughs> photos. Yeah. yeah, well, it was, yeah, it was... It certainly would have made me more money. It would have been a much better business proposition. But then again, the book was never about business. It was about putting the record straight. We'd met so many people over the years who were involved with the building of the car, um, purchasing people, engineers, uh, people from the factory, loads of them. When we, when we go to the NEC Classic Car Show, you get people coming out of the woodwork. Oh, I used to work at so-and-so. Yeah. Yeah. In the West Midlands, we used to make that bit for them, and you got. I always got a notebook with me. Yeah, because my um, all this information, but it just needed to be brought together. My father-in-law is my father-in-law yeah, is from Northern Ireland, so. Oh <laughs> right, well there yeah. he'll know all yeah, about it. He does. Yep. Yeah. Well, does. it was in 2013 that um, the chap called Nick Sutton, who was the purchasing manager, published his own book. Um, um, John DeLorean, uh, no, DeLorean, The Scandal, I'm sorry, Nick, I can't remember the exact title of your book, <laughs> but um, if, you, if you Google Nick Sutton, uh, anyway, he, he, he did this excellent book, which is from his own perspective, of, um, and he'd, he'd not consulted with many of the people that we were in touch with, but it was a great book, but it was a spur to us, we realised that uh, we'd really got to get this book of ours moving, and um, that's when Andy and I revved it up, and it took us another two years to get our book out. And, uh, of course, it got all these, these photos from the um, original photographer. So that turned it into a, a monster book, because there was no point in having um, scans of negatives, which are 27 meg. You know, they're all... They're all we've, got the me we've got the films, and we scan them with some super-duper scanners we've got. Mm. And you get all this fantastic detail. I said, well, we can't cram this into a, a normal book because you don't see them. So we ended up with a coffee table book, which weighs eight pounds, um, which is a foot square and one and a half inches thick. Yeah. And um, it's a monster book. And the, the reason is, uh, not only has it got the text in there, some text, boiled down text to the bare minimum, telling the complete story, but it's got all these lovely photos that people can sit and look at, and, you know, the amount of people who say, oh, I've seen my car there, you can see the VIN number. They have this happy habit of writing the VIN number on the back of the chassis, and when they put the body on it, they put a big um, uh, piece of polystyrene on the back, like a bumper thing, stop them damaging each other, and they put the number on there as well. So you see all these numbers around the factory and in the car park, and if you if you magnify it to a high enough resolution, you can see all the VIN numbers, which is brilliant. You know, for DeLorean Anoraks like us, that's yeah, just what yeah. you love. Have you um, <laughs> still got all the photos? Yes, oh yeah. Oh, yeah I've, so... I've, let lots of, I've let lots of people use them, mm. including a chap called Barry Wills, who helped, he was the director of purchasing. Uh, and Barry um, helped us write our book. He was going to be part of our book, but then he realised halfway through that uh, he got so much information that he'd managed to drag up from his memory and from his contacts. Mm. So he, he, he decided to write his own book, which he's done. Actually, he let him use... if you um, Google uh, a podcast called Cars Yeah, there, oh, yes. there is an interview with Barry Wills about his book. And, is... and I'll tell you what, there is another, uh, there's another, um, somebody put a link on our website mm. only a week ago. There's a fantastic um, uh, private um, 
documentary, which is also on uh, um, on the internet. It's on the YouTube. I can't remember the name of it now, but it's a fantastic one. Barry features in that, but so do a lot of the other people. Colin Spooner. Oh yeah, I've seen um, that one. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's on it's YouTube. It's really good. Yeah, it's on yeah, YouTube. Colin was Colin was a brilliant, and his brother as yeah. well, Brian. I went to meet those. In fact, they've and um, uh, they've both got. Well, obviously, copies of the book now. They all contributed. Um, lots of Lotus people. They were fantastic because I'm sure most people know that Lotus did all the development yes, work yeah. for these things. On, on, um, just going back to the club a little bit. We know it's it was formed in around '96, and you got involved in '97, and you got three, uh, about 300, 400 members currently. Uh, yes, it'll yeah. probably be near a 300 now. Mm. I retired from being secretary in 2006. I can remember that because we'd come back from um, a big meeting over in Norfolk. And, I, you know, it drains you. I'm sure you might have been involved with organising events and things. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but it, it can be very, very taxing. It and I thought, is. well, I've done my stint. And um, I retired then and, and uh, took up the um, <clears throat> less onerous office of being club historian, which tied in nicely with yeah. the production of the book. What, what, is the, um, what does the membership cost for anybody uh, who wanted to it, join? It's not changed for, since 2007, because the chap that took over from me um, only did it for a year, a chap called Mike Bosworth, and he put the subs up from £20 to £25, and they've remained at £25 since 2007. Hmm. So they're still £25, and that gets you four huge, well, not huge, but big, colour, properly produced colour mags a year, uh, plus all the other benefits of uh, cheap car insurance, and a certain amount of spares we do, uh, difficult to get spares. But um, with the aid of the internet, there are quite a few people producing spares now. Yeah. Yeah, I did notice that. What about events for the club, sort of in a year? Is there a number of events? or? Yes, uh, last year I organised one uh, at Lotus again. Um, we'd been there, the last time we went to Lotus was 2006. We have an event every year. This one coming up is near Silverstone, uh, near uh, Bletchley, uh, Bletchley, Bletchley Park, yep. um, you know, the um, uh, code breakers yes, place. Yep. Um, that's where that one is going to be in September. Um, so every year we have one major event, but because with the aid of the internet, people often say, right, what are we doing next weekend? And half a dozen cars will turn up somewhere. Yeah. And, um, you know... Yeah. I remember people... the one on Wheeler Dealers. There was a load of them, weren't there? I, I dare say you were around for that one as well, I guess. Uh, well, I didn't actually make that one. That's a long way from where I live. And having been down to the um, uh, for the love of cars yes. job, Two days filming for my, uh, uh, I think it's about two minutes that um, this old gentleman comes on a, and yeah. mutters in front of the camera. You know what it's like. They, uh, there's an awful lot of stuff gets cut out, but uh, no, it, it was good fun. But out of the two, out of the two shows, actually, I, I prefer for the love of cars. I think because I think An Anstead is a sort of genuine car designer type fella, you oh. know, and it's oh yes, absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, um, uh, I've discovered. Um, Recently, there's a lot of television programs. Um, you can't believe a word of it, no, to be honest. No. You know, <laughs> it, it, it's um, um, all right. I'm just taking the meat out of the oven. There we go. It's the Arga. Um, a lot of them are sort of real put up jobs. You, you can't believe a word of it. No. But uh, there's absolutely genuine the um, for the love of cars yes. one. Yeah. And um, the other one I like is the. Um, I can't remember the name of it now. Is it Car, Car SOS, yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, he, I'm, I'm... yeah. He's another genuine guy, isn't he, in yes. terms of, the, you know, and he's from, around, he's from around your way as well, isn't he? So it's, Is he? Yeah, oh, he's, um... he's, he's in the Midlands there somewhere. Yeah, West Midlands, I yeah. think, yeah. Yeah, so he's, no, I'm he's, he's genuine, you know. I, yeah. I, I like him when they're genuine guys because it's reality TV, but not as we know it. <laughs> That's right. Well, like yeah. I say, I've never actually met him. I've met a lot of the others that... Yeah. Uh, at car shows and things, um, but he certainly seems uh, uh, a knowledgeable chap that's not afraid to get his hands mucky. No, and he's um, he's a very successful rock musician as well. Yeah, so I understand. Yeah, a drummer. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, it's, wow. uh, so it's interesting, isn't it? Um, what yeah. about what, what products and services? You, you touched on the insurance, but what products and services do the, does a club offer? Well, um, uh, bits and bobs, spares, uh, and... Um, 
Dave Howarth, our club president, he, whenever he finds or, um, any quantity of spares of anything or anything DeLorean related, he tends to buy it. Uh, and then he tends to pass it on to club members yeah. at cost price. I remember Good. years ago when you couldn't buy a windscreen for one of these things, he got the, one of the last existing original windscreens and he had uh, 10 made by a windscreen firm because that was the minimum order. Yeah. Excellent. And they cost him £400 each. So it was 4,000 quid he paid out. And I think it took him a decade to sell them all because I had one off him. And he sold them for 400 quid. You know, that's Dave all yeah. over. That's it, though. Isn't it? I mean, that's a you know a proper club man, isn't it? That's the. But now you, know, you can actually buy one. Uh, somebody else, um, a big windscreen firm, must have got involved, or probably due to today's pattern, and they um, they're readily available now for that sort of money. Well, that's good. Yeah. That's good. It's what. Yeah. What are the future plans for the club? Is there anything sort of in the offing? Anything new or different? I don't think so. I mean, the um, it, it's just more of the same. Uh, yeah. The something that is very particular to the DeLorean Owners Club is the age of the membership. I mean, I've been in all sorts of classic car clubs: the Austin Counties Car Club, Morris Register. Uh, you know, I could rattle them all off uh, over the years. Um, but the DeLorean Owners Club, the average age of our membership is 28, and has been so since I was secretary because you get constant stream of young members joining because of the influence of the back to the future. Yeah, I was, going to, I was going to touch on the greying of the hobby because most of the clubs that I get involved in, like my old Model A and stuff like that, I mean, I'm 57 and I'm one of the youngest members. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and that's great. I mean, that means there's new blood coming in all the time and new ideas, and so it's, it's, it's a great way to keep a club going, isn't it, I think? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm 67. Mm. I'm one of the old farts. But, and, of course, if you take the average, that means there's an awful lot of really young members. Yeah, yeah. There are. Yeah. And uh, uh, so that is all down to these films. I, the youngest member I can remember recruiting <coughs> was five, and um, he got a turbocharged DeLorean that his parents had bought him. Um, uh, I'm sure he's still got it. <laughs> and and he'll, be, uh, he'll be 25 now. Right. Um, yeah, so yeah. It, it's, it's, I mean, this Back to the Future thing is a bit of a mixed blessing. Yeah, I was going to um, ask you that, actually. I actually put on one of my points later on, Back to the Future, blessing or curse. <laughs> yeah, well, let, let, let's do it now. Yeah. Um, it's, if you're going to have a DeLorean, you have to accept the fact that you're going to get an awful lot of people interested in it, comments, yeah. and the, the, uh, you know, uh, what happens when you get to eight or eight miles Yeah, I was just going to say that. Flux capacitor, you know, all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, I actually have got a flux capacitor. When I sold all my DeLorean Back to the Future stuff, I kept the flux capacitor, and it sits in the back of my car. And when they <laughs> so comment, get it out. Yeah. <laughs> um, Excellent. But, I mean, if you, if, if you don't like being looked at, I mean, one of the things I really enjoy about owning the car is the amount of attention it receives. Yes. I can't yeah. think of any other car, absolutely no other car I've owned, that you can no. drive down the road and you can see people looking at you. Yeah. People overtake you, slow down. It's not a new... It can be quite hazardous on the motorway because they tend to overtake yeah. you. Oh, Go yeah. into the inside lane, wait yeah. for you to overtake them and photograph you both ways. Yeah. Um, I mean, that was absolutely extreme when it was a full Back to the Future car, but an ordinary DeLorean does it anyway. Yeah. I mean, I can say with um, without any uh, fear of contradiction that I've only ever seen two what I call free-range DeLoreans. In all my 20-odd years that I've been looking, interested in these things, I've only ever seen two that were driving on the road. Uh, I'm, I'm not talking about when we have an event. I mm. mean, when we have an event like uh, recently in... In Norfolk, we had a joint club event, and there was over 40 of them over there. Yeah. And, of course, all the roads around Norfolk would be clogged with them. Yes. But uh, <laughs> normally, when you drive in, you know, you just don't see one. So when somebody, when you're driving, you've got to be conscious of the fact when I'm driving around that people are very interested because a lot of them, you know, the comments when you, when you actually get to talk to people... I've never seen one before, you know, and no, they're, no, they're all no. fascinated by exactly. it. What about the gold ones? Are they, I've, I've seen one, at, I, I went to the Peterson Museum in Los Angeles a few years yes. back, and they've got a gold one in there. 
That's right. Well, yeah. there used to be one in the Snyder Bank in Texas. They had the other gold one. Mm. And then there was a third one, which was um, um, when the company went bust, they'd still got a third set of spare panels. Ah. And during receivership, they decided that it would be a good idea to make uh, the last gold one up. Um, so they got the, the skeleton crew of engineers who were... Basically, anything on four wheels, um, the receiver wanted to get running. So one of the very last ones they put together, they put a brown interior in it and put all the gold panels on that, and that was the third gold car. Uh, that exists. I think that's gone into another collection. Yeah. It disappeared for decades uh, and reappeared. In fact, there was a big Sunday Times article about it about two years ago. Um, might have been three years ago. Yeah. But anyway, it... Um, those three cars, they're not that practical. I mean, it was going no. to, if, if you scratch a stainless steel car, you brush it up with a fiber pad, and you yes. can't see where you've scratched it. Now, if you've got a, um, a gold-plated stainless steel car, if you scratch it, you're going to see stainless steel yeah, through your gold. Absolutely. So it really isn't a very um, practical, uh, practical thing, thing no. to have. So they, they just, and they were very expensive, so they just tend to live in museums. That, you know, yeah. they don't get driven around. And to my mind, if you've got a classic car, you might as well drive it yeah. and uh, let people look at it. Use it or lose it, isn't it? That's the thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, of course, with the DeLorean, because people are so interested in it, uh, letting them look at it is a very important part of it. Yeah. I, I, there's a, a guy that I know in the States who does a, um, a podcast over there, and he had a, an interview with um, the Illinois dealer for the new DeLorean Motor Company. And oh, yeah. During the yeah, interview, yeah, I was yeah. absolutely... Um, I didn't realise the slight but no- noticeable production differences with the different bonnet um, vents and bits and pieces. And I didn't realise there was that many differences. And then there were some rare wheels and there was this and that. And I, d- I just didn't realise that there was, in that short space of production, there were so many little nuances. I didn't Well, I was um, listening the other day uh, to that thing that um, I found on YouTube, and um, uh, Steve Wynn, who is in charge of DMC Houston, and James Espy mm. is um, second in command. They are the people that are producing the new yes. cars, or will be producing them. And he was saying there were some 3,000 production changes. I mean, some of them will be changing this washer and putting yeah. a different screw in it and that. But there was, because the thing got off from a standing start and they'd done it all in such a short record period of time, inevitably there were sort of um, production changes that went along. And one of the issues they found that when they were pressing the stainless steel, um, the, it wears this presses out more than mild steel because it, it's, it's a more difficult metal to press. And there's a thing called spring back where they have to, the presses have to be adjusted for that. So when they, then when they press it and they take the press off it, it comes back a bit. So it all adds to the complications. And particularly the bonnets, you mentioned changes. Well, there were three different sorts of bonnets. The first ones were grooved gas flap bonnets. Yes. The second yeah. one... They didn't bother with the gas flap, but they still got the grooves. And the third one was completely plain bonnet. I won't say flat. It looks flat, but it's still got curvature on it. But the reason, really, when talking to the buyers was that it was wearing the tools out so quickly, it was cheaper to keep simplifying the tool um, than to have a slightly more complicated tool. That was one of the reasons, certainly. I had heard a story, whether it's an urban myth or not, that some of the tooling ended up weighing down fishing nets or something like that. Oh, no, that. It's, it's, it's all in the book. You've not read my book, no, have you? I haven't, no. I, I, I'm, I'm going to have to talk to you about that after this, about getting a book. So yes, I'm, oh, well, I'm, I'm definitely sure we going to yeah. I'm de- I'm definitely yes, gonna have a book off you. Yeah, well, that's all right. I'll do your deal. Um, <laughs> And if anybody's listening once, well, I can do them a sign cost for you to deal as well. No, I'm no, going to promote this when it goes out, and I'll make sure that I um, put that in there for you as well. All so. right. Yeah. Well, yes, they did actually. Uh, when a company goes bust, I mean, I've been, when I was got my Derby plating hat on, we actually bought out a couple of companies that had gone bust because you want the equipment. Um, but you always end up with a load of stuff you don't want. Hmm. Now, when DeLorean went bust, there was lots and lots of d- doors and things and uh, um, other panels. Uh, n- near side front wings, for some reason, they were short of those. Uh, but I heard that. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, he, 
it's not an issue because they can be repaired or yeah. made. Um, but um, when you've got all these um, panels kicking around and no cars to put them on, um, there's not much point in hanging on to the extremely expensive and heavy press moulds. So they all ended up at the scrapyard. It was, you'll hear, you'll read where people said it was a British government conspiracy that nobody could ever start making them again. They were all <laughs> thrown in the sea. But what actual fact happened is when, a, a, when the company went bust, uh, the scrap man come in and clear up all the stuff nobody wants. Well, it all ended up in um, a scrap yard in the south of Ireland and uh, sat around in their yard for a long time, all these different bits. They came from the um, uh, people that pressed the panels, these big big castings, uh, lapel in the Irish Republic just across the border. Uh, so that's why they ended up down there. And, of course, you get people come in there from time to time, like I've done, you know, looking for a bit of scrap metal. Yeah. And this yeah. particular firm went in there looking for some big heavy bits because they'd got some fish, uh, salmon fish cages uh, offshore and they wanted things to anchor them down. And he said, oh, well, just what you want here, look, look at all these. Yeah. yeah. And so oh, they oh. ended up buying a load of them. And um, I've actually got photos of the ship that took them out. It was called yeah. the Seven Princess. I, I um, completely agree with you on the um, not a conspiracy theory thing, because my dad ran a scrapyard for 25 years. Um, yeah. we, he used to get all manner of things coming in there from Ford Motor Company, press, you know, stuff from presses and everything else. And quite rightly, it would either be cut up and used for something else or melted down or, you know. And it, if this stuff's in the scrapyard, as you say, someone will come in and use it for something else. It's recycled. Yeah, and, that, that, yeah. and that's what happened. Yeah. Um, some of the, um, the same steel was all made by British Steel in Sheffield. It was rolled in uh, Wales. Um chopped up and pressed in um, lapel in the Irish Republic. And um, when they went bust, there were some rolls of um, stainless steel that had not been used. And uh, there's even a little comment in the back of the book. There's a chap, um, he was an artist, actually, Shane Lynch, I think his name is. The poet, his piece is in the back. And he went around hunting down all these bits of scrap and things like that. And he ended up um, going around these scrap yards, and they could remember this stuff going in vividly. Um, because, you know, you don't get uh, things that weigh a couple of ton of uh, stainless steel or cast iron coming in all the time. And um, this steel ended up um, being used for other things. Um, there's um, uh, some roller shutter doors and uh, doors to a warehouse, all made out of this stainless steel, which... Should have been DeLorean, uh, you know, wing parts. <laughs> what, do you, parts. what do you feel about um, what went into production against, as opposed to his vision for the car? Well, I think that it was very near to his vision. Um, but, of course, you know, having a vision and practically having a, a, a business which is producing stuff and got to actually make a living, uh, got to earn its keep, there were inevitably compromises as the thing was brought into production. Mm. Um, the two prototypes that had been made in America, uh, pro properly called concept cars, they were done to basically raise money. Uh, they were driven around, they got Citroen engines in them, and the interiors are far from finished. They've got a tiny fuel tank, no room for a spare wheel. They weren't, they weren't prototype cars, they weren't even pre-production cars. They were concept cars mm. that happened to drive. Now, the finished one looked virtually identical to those, slightly different wheels, slightly different interior, two inches longer to get the mechanicals in there, but, you know, you, you, the average person wouldn't tell the difference. So the thing that went into production was very similar to what John DeLorean had envisaged all along. Uh, but, of course, it had been uh, um, completely redesigned for mechanical purposes by Lotus, um, who knew that it had got to meet American regulations and the original design was basically a bit like a mini in which it's got subframes front and back, mm. a fiberglass composite body with the, the subframes, which was light and did the job, but they said that it would never pass federal crash tests. And so uh, they agreed with DeLorean that it would have a Lotus Esprit-type chassis, mm. 
which Lotus just happened to have on their drawing board, and it didn't take a lot to modify it to fit the DeLorean. Um, but, I mean, it was done in such a tight time scale that they had very little choice than to put... It was slightly compromised. They, they, you know, there was no choice. As it was, they produced the thing in just over two years from a green field to a production. I mean, that, that's absolutely incredible, isn't it, if you think about it? I mean, from drawing board to on the road in, in just under two years, I mean, you'd yeah. never get that happen now. No, I mean, you well, just wouldn't. before... Um, DeLorean teamed up with Lotus, he actually spoke to um, uh, Porsche, and they wanted five years just to just to productionise it. Yeah. And he hadn't got five years. He knew the money was going to be running out very quickly, yeah. and it, it just had to um, be done much quicker than that. Yeah. Just, just on to John DeLorean, I mean, as I mentioned to you the other day on the phone, I've read um, his book, you know, the, when he was at GM, Yep. And then also the Grand Delusion book. They're the two books that I've read. And just, you know, reading about the guy, he's pretty amazing, I think. <laughs> the fact that he probably would have been in charge of GM completely before deciding to go off and do his own thing, which is quite exactly, amazing. Exactly, but he was a square peg in a round hole. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, he was, um, uh, he was a very good engineer, but he was even better at spotting opportunities. Yeah. Um, as he was leading a team of engineers and going around the factory and that, um, there were quite a few innovations that he saw and realized the potential of and ended up buying the rights to. <coughs> um, so he was very good at recognizing opportunities. Yes. Um, I mean, particularly, uh, I think, what a lot of people don't realize is, and you know well, that all his, you know, his Pontiac days with the GTO and all the rest of it, that he'd been doing this kind of thing from way back, hadn't he? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, he was, he was, um, um, although we, uh, he used to say that he was a good engineer, and I'm sure he was, mm. um, but he was a bit like Chapman, who was also a good engineer, but they were better at organising things, organising businesses, spotting opportunities, taking advantages of situations. Uh, you know, they were entrepreneurs. Uh, I mean, they they were the Bransons of the day, yeah. really. From, from what I sure. from what I read of him, um, the style of the DeLorean actually suited him down to the ground because he was a very stylish looking man for his time as well, wasn't he? I think. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, um, he that was in the latter years when mm. he was in his middle years at GM. He um, uh, snubbed his nose at convention and used to come to work in jeans yeah. and uh, open neck shirts. Now, when you worked at GM and you got over a certain level, you came to work in a black three-piece suit yep. or two-piece suit, certainly, with a tie and collar and all the rest of it. Well, he went through a phase where he was sort of metaphorically holding two fingers up to GM and said, no, I'll do it my way. Mm. And so I think uh, he was inevitably going to find things a bit tricky trying to fit in with everybody there and um obviously it, it, he, from his point of view he preferred the idea of working for himself he don't have to answer anybody no else, exactly then. did did he did he do the deal um with the british government for the dunmurray site or was that done by someone else was that his oh, doing well, I, I mean he was uh, he would certainly have the final say in it um he got quite a team of uh, people around him at that stage um, from america um, they were actually, most of the team were holed up in Puerto Rico, where they'd got a, a deal almost ready to be yes, signed. Yes, I read that in uh, the book. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was going to be uh, at some former Air Force base out there, and it was, of course, fairly near to America, and uh, it would have suited them quite well. Yeah. But when the um, wind got to the British government in the name of the <laughs> Northern Ireland office, they thought, well, we could have a go at this. Mm. Uh, he'd already been sniffing around the Irish Republic, but they'd uh, decided that it was too risky. Yeah. But then when the Northern Ireland office got involved, uh, they thought it, uh, it stood a reasonable chance, and they certainly saw the chance of getting several thousand people off the dole and into work. Definitely. And it was, um, while the Labour government were in charge at that particular time, that's when the deal was done, and then a couple of years, well, no less than a couple of years later, but before they'd even started building, the, uh, Mrs. Thatcher had come into power. And, of course, it was a slightly different complexion. Mm. And then she was not in favour of subsidising things. She once told somebody, I've got two problems 
uh, British Leyland and DeLorean, and I want to get rid of one of them. And that was... Got, uh, rid, of, got rid of the wrong one. <laughs> no, yeah. But you see, that was right towards the end when they were in receivership, yeah. when she could have um, organised um, uh, Secretary of State uh, uh, to pull the stops out and, and rev the thing up and get everything working again. But she just wanted rid of one of them. Yeah, and that was Jim DeLorean Pryor, was wasn't it? I think it was Jim Pryor. Jim Pryor, that that's time, right. Yeah. But it was a flea yeah. bite. DeLorean was a tiny thing compared yeah. to British Leyland, which was a huge yeah. conglomerate, uh, unwieldy beast, which ultimately went bust anyway. Well, from, um, a, from a sociological point of view, it was it was good for the community too, wasn't it? Because you had Catholics and Protestants working there together, and it was it, it, as, as, an, as a social thing, it would have been a great success, let alone oh, and it anything was. else. And the, um, the fact that <laughs> they used to, the Protestants came in one door and Catholics came yeah. in the other door, well, that was purely because the site was put between the two communities yeah. and it was easier for them to come in one side than yeah. walk right the way around the um, you know, site and come in the other doors. Yeah. But they worked together and there was, not, there was no political stuff allowed in the factory. Right. And I, I was talking to somebody who was actually the toilet cleaner and he said to me, he said, well, you did used to get things scrawled on the wall during the night shift. <laughs> so we would always got them cleared off by the morning and yeah. it was never an issue. Because the, so the urban myth was that both of the, uh, you know, the, the sort of political organisations on both sides basically said, leave it alone because it's providing jobs and everything else. So it's you don't touch it. So that no, was, absolutely. Yeah. In fact, yeah. one of the... Um, um, uh, I better not mention his name, no. but um, um, he appears in quite a few of the photos, funnily yeah. enough. He was just a, gen a general worker at the factory, but he was also um, uh, associated with a certain paramilitary group. Yeah. And I've spoken to him on many occasions since, and he's, um, since then he's fully in favour of all the peace process, which most yep. of the people are. But in their day, in 1978, when the, the deal was done to, uh, to build this factory on a cow, pasture uh it was a war zone there yes it definitely. was it was outright yeah. war every single day things were yeah. getting blown up and people were getting murdered and bumped off and it was you know the country was a dead loss and i like to think that this factory which sowed some of the first seeds of um you know normalizing the of course we've been back many times in fact last yeah. time I was there was only about three weeks ago and, um, you know, it's a lovely place now. All right, you get the odd uh, nutter anywhere. You get yes. them anywhere in yeah. any country. I mean, we've had them in America recently. We had them in, Fra had them in France, France yesterday. Yeah, yeah France yesterday. Yeah. So yeah. you're never going to get rid of that entirely. No. But generally speaking, uh, the place is a wonderful place now. And, you know, I love going there. Me and my wife, we, we often go. Yeah. Right, we're getting near the end now, so I've got a final question for you. Really, is what might have been for the car and DeLorean, and what do you think might have happened next, and all that kind of stuff? Well, um, unfortunately, DeLorean had a slight habit of um, um, living a lifestyle of a GM executive when he was on specialist car uh, production. He was the equivalent of. Um, um, uh, what's that firm in Blackpool? <laughs> oh, TVR. Um, yeah, TVR. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you think about it, it was not a lot different to sort of a TVR no, or no. a Reliant. Not at all. Uh, but, of course, uh, DeLorean had had a very illustrious background and he couldn't, he flew everywhere by Concord. He, um, the, the winter when they were in receivership, he was going around hold, handing out Rolex watches and Cartier pens to his senior <laughs> managers yeah. uh, when, they hadn't, when they couldn't afford to pay the um, supplier bills. Yeah. So he was slightly removed from reality from that point of view. And so uh, what might have been, had he been a little less uh, free with the money, um, they could have uh, got by the difficult times um, and possibly not had to go into receivership at all. Um, had they scale, not scaled the production up to such dizzy heights, the, the quality would have been better, but he got a share option thing that he was launching in America and he wanted maximum production to make that look good. So they were the man himself... Um, some of the things that made him great also made his actions slightly questionable. 
Mm. But uh, as I say to many people, there would be no DeLorean car without John DeLorean. So that's the first thing. You know, it's his vision and thoughts and things that got it off the ground. But because he, like most people, had got his weaknesses and his blind spots, uh, he perhaps wasn't the best man then to keep it running. You know? It's often the way, isn't it? Someone who has the vision and starts a company often then isn't the person to take it on to the next level, I think. And in all fairness, yeah. um, that's what was... Uh, the share Had the share launch gone ahead, um, had the weather not been so awful in the winter of 81, had some negative press not come out when the share launch was happening, the share launch would have happened people would have bought shares, uh, ultimately DeLorean would have sold out, and the company could still still well have been going now. Yeah. It's a distinct possibility. Definitely. Had he not gone down with his suitcase full of cocaine, the company still would have been going because the rescue deal was all on the table. Barry Wills and a group of them had got a, uh, they'd done a deal with the receiver, and they were just waiting, um, or just waiting and waiting until DeLorean's option to come up with the money um, had um, expired but of course we now know that the reason he, his option uh, didn't expire was because he was being strung along by the FBI who yeah. had got yeah. him sorted out as um, a fall guy for some drugs deal yeah. and I don't think there's any doubt that he uh, that it was a setup from start to finish he wouldn't have gone looking for it but on no. the other hand because he was a bit of an entrepreneur, he got interested before he knew what it was about and then claimed he couldn't get out of it. Too so late. what the rights and wrongs of that, we'll never know. Yeah, but the fact right. is that going down in a cloud of um, uh, questionable dealings meant that the company was absolutely doomed and there was no way back from that. That's a good, good place to end, I think. It's been a pleasure talking to you and I'd like to think that one or two people might like to buy the book. Cheers, Chris, and I'll speak to you soon. A pleasure to speak to you.